the SPS Digital Learning Hour. Brought to you by the Digital Learning and Assessment Department. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Mike Thomas. And I'm Suzanne Zargis. We're coming to you from a conference room in Central Office, bringing you the latest news in the Springfield Public Schools in regards to technology, along with inspiring interviews from teachers who are using technology in the classroom. We'll also inform you of the latest updates, practices, and news as it pertains to our district. Whether you are new to using technology in the classroom or are a seasoned vet, we are here to help. Thanks for joining us today. In case you missed it, the latest blog post is up and it actually talks all about SAMR. In the blog post, we go ahead and define what SAMR is. It's part of an ongoing series of posts that we will have all year long that we are totally excited about and we're hoping to pull in some other teachers into it too. So for now, you kind of just get an overall SAMR defined, that's what we called it. That will allow you to kind of get more of an understanding if you don't remember from our conversation last week or last year. That's it for In Case You Missed It. Coming up next, Hot Takes. So for this week's hot takes, Suzanne and I are going to continue our conversation all around SAMR from last week. It was a very long conversation, and one of the things we wanted to do was to make sure that you were not sitting here listening to us talking for two hours or so about SAMR, because we're excited about it, and we really care deeply about using technology in the classroom well. Go ahead and continue listening. Are you ready to integrate technology into your classroom? And if you can do this lesson without technology, that's great. But if you can do it better with technology, then go for it and give it a try. I mean, the SAMR model it really does cover a breadth of technology tools. Students typing up in Word to using Movie Maker. I mean, it's kind of crazy with the things that you are able to do. So one of the great things about this article, Suzanne, is that it actually sets up with a whole bunch of questions that you can ask yourself about integrating technology into the classroom. Some that are like, what is the gain of replacing the existing method with new technology? That would be at the S level. What's the gain of having students type up a paper instead of handwriting it? I can think of a few quick things off the top of my head that editing is a lot easier. Students don't get frustrated when they have to rewrite it because all rewriting means on the computer is moving things around, typing, deleting, instead of rewriting the entire thing again. So, I mean, those are, and the spell check, but the spell check comes with the augmentation, so. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just visualizing yeah. students with big erasers erasing half a page. Yeah, I mean, I remember those days. So, like, does the new technology add new features or improve the previous methods? Again, that goes back to, like, the e-reader. Like, if I'm reading this story as a, a book that I'm holding, what's the improvement that the new technology that I'm using, in this case, an e-reader, what improvement does that have? And is it worth it? Because a lot of times we can come up with these great ideas with using technology in the classroom, but we have to ask ourselves, is it worth it? Will my students gain more from this? Right. And again, it depends on the population in front of you. And it's not to say that every tool is going to be the perfect tool for every teacher in that particular lesson. So don't be afraid to try one thing, whether it's substitution or augmentation, try something. And then at the end of that lesson or at the end of a few lessons, you might sit there and think, you know what, that wasn't worth it. That was not efficient. That did not meet the objective that I had set. And then try something else. Right. And we're not by no means saying don't use technology because you don't think that it's going to be effective or you're going to gain stuff out of it. I think we could both, I'm going to safely say for the both of us, we think that with using technology, it adds a lot to the classroom, but it comes back to the tasks that you have in front of you. Because if you don't have great tasks, doesn't matter what the technology is, it's just not going to work. Exactly. 
Now, do you think that every teacher needs to be a master of all of the technology that they're integrating into a lesson? Because I think that's probably a point of fear that many teachers have. Well, how can I integrate technology into a lesson if I don't feel as though I'm an expert in that particular tool? So my short answer is no. You don't need to be an expert, and most likely you're not going to be an expert. I could put my laptop in front of a bunch of students, and they could probably do things that I that would run circles around me. And I'm fairly tech savvy. I wouldn't. To me, it's kind of that fear of the unknown. It's like when you have a. It's like midnight outside, pitch black, no lights, and you just start walking. One of the exercises we used to do when I went off to summer camp. There was this giant field between all the buildings, and we knew that what was in the field. There was nothing other than grass. And so one of the things that we would do to challenge ourselves was to start running and close our eyes and run. It would allow us to kind of embrace that fear of not knowing what's in front of us and learning that it's okay. And if we fell, we laugh, we get up, we try again. And I think that same approach can be taken with using technology in the classroom. You're going to try things. They're probably going to fail. They're probably going to succeed. But you won't know until you try and you're willing to give up a little of that control in the classroom. Right. I think that's the key. I like the analogy of the darkness and not being able to see where you're going. I'm not so sure I would close my <laughs> eyes when I ran. But I do like the analogy in that. It was I exhilarating. Think... <laughs> I'm going to tell you that. I think um, I'm guessing a stumbling point for some teachers might be that when they are writing their lesson plans and they're they're writing those objectives, they may be thinking, well, how can I write an objective for a specific piece of technology if I am not a master of that technology? So it's finding that balance point of, okay, I'm going to use this type of technology. I do have an overall objective for the lesson, and then I need to see if the technology helped my students reach that objective or not. And I think that's actually one of the areas where like, our department can really come in and help with teachers is when you have your tasks and you have your lesson plans, instead of being like, my plan today is to use Movie Maker. I'm going to tell you you're going to not succeed in whatever else you had going on. But if your plan was um, students are going to display their knowledge of fractions by making a video teaching others how to use fractions, now you are getting more into the realm of will Movie Maker work for that? Could they just use the and do something like a screencast using Office Mix? Like, Then we can start talking about, like, what piece of technology would help with that? What are the steps that need to go into doing that? So it's kind of like coming up with the end task. Once you have your end task of what you want to do, how does technology fit into that? And so I think with a lot of these questions, and we're going to post this all up on our show notes so that you can see them. Maybe not the pictures, because that doesn't apparently go through very well. I've tried. But we'll have a lot of these questions. We'll have links to this article and other articles all about the SAMR model. But the idea that no matter what you're doing in the classroom, SAMR is not about just trying to shove technology into it. We don't want to just shove technology into the classroom because it's there. I'm not going to use my document camera just because my document camera is there and I feel like I need to use it. You don't need to use any of it. You need to teach your students and you need to use whatever method is going to be best for them. I completely agree, Mike. And one, I read a quote uh, earlier this week that I've actually put into the signature on my email. And part of it, I won't remember the whole thing, but part of it talks about immersing yourself into the world of your students. So when we think of all the technology that our students use today, teachers need to allow themselves the freedom to, to immerse themselves into that same world, knowing that it's going to take time to master everything but to be as willing and enthusiastic as our students are. And instead of having that fear of, oh, I don't know how that works. Oh, I'm going to break it. Oh, it, the power ran out. You know, it, my, whole, mm-hmm. my whole presentation collapsed. Instead of having all these fears, just thinking positively and, um, and just, again, going into that same world that the students are in. Can't fail that way.
So this last section of the article, which is where we're going to wrap up with today's like our hot take talking, is this idea of integrating edtech tools the SAMR way, which goes back to what we were just talking about before, which is you can't start with a tool and fit it into whatever lesson or unit you're doing. It needs to be the other way around and figuring out what you need. Digital tools allow us to have control over what and how we can alter an image that was unimaginable in an era of analog photography. It's a quote from Pedro Meyer. I'm not sure who he is. But the idea that these tools can allow us to take our lessons and go to far off places with them. Things that were unimaginable 10 years ago. Like I think about like doing a Skype, mystery Skype, 10 years ago, not a chance. But now with how technology has changed over the last 10 years, I can see how mystery Skypes could help us with our critical thinking. It can help us with our geography. It can help us with whatever we set our mystery Skype up to be talking about. And so I think this idea in this section, actually, what I really liked about it was it took like each level, the substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition, and said, if you do this, do this. And it gave like the tech equivalent to it, which I really liked and I appreciated because a lot of times I know when I've prepared, when I'm, when I have prepared SAM or model articles for the blog, everything is here is the task, do this, do this, do this, do this for each of the levels. And I'm like, well, that really doesn't kind of help me with how can I think of that before I read somebody else telling me how to do that? And so like, I guess it comes back to having a knowledge of what the tool, what's possible with the tools. And that's what I really liked about this section. Right. I think that's the hardest part for for many teachers is that visual. How does what I'm doing now fit into the SAMR model? And how can I move forward within that model? The, the visual, the concrete examples mm-hmm. are invaluable. So I'm sure, Mike, if anybody were to email DLA support <laughs> with any questions on SAMR, we'd be happy to further explain Mm -hmm. or go see what they're doing and offer suggestions. Yeah. I mean, we love to be out in schools and we'd love to help you in in this area because digital learning and assessment, while the assessment is a large part of our job, there is those first two words, digital learning, which is where I I would say all four of us are really passionate about in our department, about being able to help teachers in using technology effectively in the classroom. I love some of the examples on here. So for substitution, using the OneDrive. I mean, they say Google Docs, but I'm going to say OneDrive because we have the OneDrive. I was wondering how you were going to approach that, Mike, because we everything on one. here was Google Docs, Google Forms. But we have Microsoft versions of all of them. So think about the tools on Microsoft. To give a basic assessment, you can use Microsoft Forms. You could also use the quiz tool in Brightspace. To, and this was my favorite one because I remember being a teacher, the whole idea of self-grading. There was a reason why I loved using the Envisions online and ANET, even though I wasn't a big fan of all the questions, but that's neither here nor there. They graded it and it was graded like that, which as a teacher, that's invaluable time to get back. And when it's graded like that, you can get data, actionable data, almost as fast. Just like Brightspace. Just like Brightspace. And with the augmentation, streamlining data, which you can go to the data warehouse and you can get that Excel spreadsheet of all your assessments that students have done, where they're at with their FMP levels and all those levels. The idea of starting to create a digital portfolio, Brightspace has one and we're working on figuring out how best to implement that tool throughout all grades. With modification, that's using creatively using videos and images. I think back to like doing the about me's when I was in school, the teacher would have a whole bunch of like magazines and you like you cut pictures out of the magazines and like, this is all about me. Here's a picture of Pele. Here is my favorite food, this pizza that this person is eating, even though this person looks nothing like me, but I like pizza and this person likes pizza. So that's all about me. So like taking that and multiplying it by a hundred. Now I can make a little video. Now I can green screen myself into my favorite things. Here's me standing on top of a pepperoni pizza. Here's me swimming in a bowl of ice cream. I mean, the ideas are really endless with this. With redefinition, it's connecting students with experts using Skype. That's one of the great things about Skype in the classroom is like you authors are set up on there to do interviews, to do book talks, 
you can do a lot of project-based learning with accessing experts. Like if I'm working on a project on the water cycle, I could go to a textbook, read all about it, or I could go talk to a meteorologist. And for us and where we work and in this city, it's hard for us to have field trips and it's hard for us to get access to experts to come easily. That's where like the redefinition of the task, like we want experts to come or we want to go out to experts, but we can't, but we can Skype and we can have a live person, live interactive person. I would love for my students to go see um, Yellowstone National Park, but guess what? That's many states away. And so I could do a virtual tour with a real life tour guide taking us all around. And just those things are just so exciting that these are possibilities now that 10 years ago were not possible. Exactly. It's all good. It's so exciting. And and I love everything about it. I, I always try to put myself into um, a new teacher's shoes, right? And I'm thinking, okay, what would somebody debate about with this whole topic. And the only thing that comes to mind, other than what I've already mentioned, is the time factor. You know, are there teachers out there that are thinking, oh, I just don't have the time to figure this out and make sure that it's going to work in my classroom. So Mike, if somebody emailed DLA support and said, can you help me figure out how to Skype in my classroom? Is that something DLA support would respond to? Oh my gosh. We totally would. That's part of what digital learning is all about, Suzanne. And would you actually go to the school to help them figure it all out? Suzanne, you know me. I'm a jet setter. I don't like to sit in my office. And when I mean jet setter, I get my little Honda Civic and I drive to all the schools. I, I know for me, I'm willing to go anywhere to any student within our district or any teacher, any student, any administrator who's trying to do these things. Because we want you to succeed with this. Because we see the value in it. There is data out there that supports this value. And so for us, our job is really trying to help you with integrating technology. Because or because you're by yourself. Anytime I start a presentation with teachers, I'm like, one of the reasons we do the things we do is because most of the time you can't leave this room. <laughs> and they And they appreciate that, Suzanne. They appreciate that we're willing to come to them when they're available to help them do something. I know last week I was with a teacher who was really wanting to do coding with her special ed students. And so we looked at ways to start doing coding with that particular group of students. I got there a few minutes early, and so I was actually sitting in the classroom as they were finishing up their morning meeting. And let me tell you, this teacher was using technology in a way that was perfect for her students. Awesome. It was, she was using the white, the interactive whiteboard with this group of students. They were all engaged. They were all learning. They were all working, which I was like, after like the students went down to their gym class for the day, I'm like, that was excellent. And so like, I even got the chance to reaffirm her before we started talking about all these new things that she was wanting to try to do. See, I think a lot of teachers are doing much more than they give themselves credit for. I would agree with that too. And I just uh, also need to mention that, yes, we are absolutely willing to go to your classroom and do absolutely as much as we can to help. Um, Just keep in mind that our team is small for the entire district. (laughs) So we may not be there tomorrow, (laughs) but we will get there as soon as we can. Yeah, with only four of us, it definitely is hard to get out, but we do make the time for it. We move a lot of our meetings around so that we can accommodate the teachers that are trying to do to use technology in the classroom and so that we can meet with them. With this article, they also included a chart, which I know most of you are going to, when I say the word, you're going to go, oh, he's, I knew he was going to bring that part in too, which is the Bloom's taxonomy, which is one of those things that we in the district have constantly been working with and on. There's a nice little pie chart um, that has the SAMR model included with the different levels of the Bloom's. There's a few different ones of these out there. And so it's very important to note that if you're trying to reach those higher order thinking skills, SAMR does that with you in conjunction. Just like good technology in your lesson is good for your lesson. And if you don't have a good lesson, the technology can't make it better. Right. I loved that that chart that you're referring to, Mike. And if, if anyone um, wants to 
see this very quickly uh, without going out to all the, the links that are always available after our podcasts. Uh, if you simply Google SAMR and then look at mm-hmm. the images versus the files, <laughs> you'll most likely see this one as one of the top choices. It's a, it's a great visual and really helps, um, helps you make connections between what you're doing in the classroom and how it relates to SAMR and Bloom's tox- taxonomy. Yeah. So some of our final thoughts on this as we've been talking for a while now, and we do have a good interview that we want you to listen to afterwards, after just us talking, because there's a lot going on and we definitely like to share, is that coming back to where where we started with this was don't use technology for the sake of using technology. Like really think about how it will make your lesson better, not just easier. Right. I can't, I can't add much more to that, Mike. Uh, just saying the same thing. You, you, it's a matter of making better decisions about the digital resources that you are integrating into your classroom. Just think about why you're using a particular tool instead of thinking you need to use any tool. Why did you choose the tool that you did? Yeah. I like one of the last sentences. Is There's no doubt that technology can improve teaching and learning, but the fact is it is not a magic wand. You will not get favorable results by adding technology to a badly designed task. Technology will show its power only when it's in a great teacher's hand. I love that. Can you say it again, Mike? Because I did (laughs) love that. The whole thing? No, just that last sentence. Technology will show its power only when it is in a great teacher's hand. That's going up on my board. (laughs) I love it. So for Suzanne and I, this SAMR conversation is one that we're probably going to be continuing year long, and hopefully we'll be bringing some other people in to discuss it with us as we are talking during Hot Takes. Coming up next is the rest of our interview with Dan Mansell from Boland Elementary. There sounds like there's a lot of exciting things that have been going on that I've asked. Are there things that you want to share with our listeners that um, either that you've done or that you're planning on doing this coming school year that you're really excited about? Well, one thing that we've talked about in the past is the um, the chance to start podcasting within our own building. Um, I'm excited mm-hmm. about that. Now I'm going to need to develop those skills on my own too. We And we've had conversations mm-hmm. about, you know, what micro- microphone should I use and and how, uh, you know, just the basic nuts and bolts of how to get it started. I'm looking forward to, to try and roll it out with our ELL students here uh, to develop, to use it as a tool to develop their language and to get them to be able to express mm-hmm. themselves, uh, whether it's, you know, on their own or, you know, back and forth with, with their fellow classmates. I'm looking forward to getting... Um, to getting uh, or digging deeper a little more into the whole video production side of things and uh, uh, whether it's uh, using some of the tools. I know the district has provided some other schools with some some technology to do the green mm-hmm. screen kind of thing. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, I was going to say, I was heard you mention green screen early on in our interview. So that green screen is one of the cooler things that I've seen some of the other schools do. So. Yeah, and it can lend itself to to so many different things. Like if they're doing, like for instance, the that Regents U.S. Regents project I, I mentioned mm-hmm. before, to have them be able to share things that they've learned about their particular region, and then have different scenes from that part of the United States behind them that they can you know interact with in some way mm-hmm. would be just so cool. But I think one one of the first ways that we'll start to that I'll start to try and learn how to do is uh, just to simply do it for morning announcements. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because the majority of the classrooms here at Boland either have a Bright Links interactive whiteboard or a smart board. So I think to to teach um, the students how to do that and eventually release that responsibility off to them would be great because the goal is to really get them to be the producers Mm -hmm. uh, of the content instead of having them constantly just consume, you know, whatever is on the screen in front of them. Where 
you know, we're trying to build the next computer scientists. And so teaching all, all these uh, things that we're doing now where we're teaching them how to code and program and instead of playing the video game, creating their own video game, um, but also making sure that it always ties back into the instructional learning standards that we need to push for, for all our students. Yeah. With this being Boland, um, one of the things we talked about in last season's podcast, you guys did a PD day where it was teachers teaching other teachers technology. Now, from your position as the instructional technology teacher, can you kind of describe how you saw the day and how it went and your thoughts on it? Yeah, so the day, and, and this this day happened because um, our principal, uh, Lisa Bukowski, uh, really is trying to um, provide all of us whatever resources and time to learn how to use technology in in the most practical and most useful way. So she really she really is is pushing us to share uh, mm-hmm. with each other as a staff some of the things that are happening in the classroom. So the day kind of uh, was structured where. We all came together and talked about, you know, the whole, uh, the reason why the day was happening because with such a large building, there are so many different things going on in everybody's classroom that uh, every teacher knows that it's sometimes it's really hard to, you know, look outside your own room and, uh, and, get a chance to talk with another classroom mm-hmm. teacher. Once we broke out into uh, the individual sessions, the day was kind of set up where teachers were asked by uh, Lisa to share maybe one tool that they mm-hmm. were using or one project that they did with technology. And I mean, that's also the plus of her being a principal. She gets to go into all these classrooms where as a teacher, I remember once that 830 bell rings, you're that classroom till 330 by yourself or with with people coming in and out. But you can't get out and go see other teachers as easily. So Right. So and the the nice thing about the day was that there were were sessions run by other classroom teachers and Lisa also had the expectation that the administrators would present something as well. So Lisa presented um, something on the new uh, computer science standards that uh, we'll be focusing on this year. And then we have two other assistant principals and they shared a tool that they had just learned about or uh, thought would be useful for other people to use. So the teachers who weren't presenting were able to pick and choose what tool or what session Mm -hmm. they wanted to go to. And the great thing about the sessions were that the first maybe 20 minutes of the session, and they usually ran you know, between 40 and 50 minutes long. Mm -hmm. The first part of it was the introduction to the tool and how that classroom teacher might be using it. And then the other half was, it just gave the teachers time to really experiment with it and figure out how they might be able to use it while talking, you know, to each other, which was really great because the teachers were saying uh, was the best part of the day was to be allowed to have the time Mm -hmm. To really, you know, focus in on the tool and about how they may use it for their own particular classroom instead of just listening and watching and and doing something like that. So it became a really useful day. Most of the teachers here uh, thought it was one of the best PDs that they had all year long. So we're going to kind of follow that up Mm -hmm. too. And the way Lisa chose the people to present, she, you know, gave anybody the option to do it. But we also have, Lisa also has created something called the digital leadership team here. So it's a bunch of different classroom teachers throughout the building. And we come together um, usually once a month and we talk about, you know, things that we're doing, ways to, um, ways to make sure that for, in the case uh, for us last year, how the one-to-one um, mm-hmm. is going with our uh, grades three through five, how the pilot program was going to work, the take-home program was going to work. The members of the digital leadership team um, presented, and then uh, the administrators presented. So there was a buy-in from everybody in the building, which was mm-hmm. great. And then that comfort level, too, of like, you know, if you're, in, if you're a preschool teacher, if you're a kindergarten teacher, you know, what tool makes sense for me to kind of learn how to use Right, because you're not going to expect them to type up a two-page paper. Right. But what was nice is that the, the, the sessions allowed teachers to kind of try something the very next day, mm-hmm. uh, whether it was, you know, how to use Kahoot for not only to, you know, have the kids feel like they're playing a game and the, the competition is there, but also to use it as a formative assessment. Because Kahoot is the type of site that um, many teachers uh, 
are familiar with it most likely, but um, it's a way for you to create your own quizzes online. And then there's like a leaderboard. Where, yeah, uh, it's total compete. competition. Yeah, so it's fun and things like, uh, and then other tools like Quizlet, um, you know, how, how can you use that to um, increase uh, vocabulary? So yeah, the the day as a whole um, was fantastic. It was a really positive, useful day for the staff. And we're looking forward to uh, doing it again. But I did mention the digital leadership team here. One of the things we're, I'm also excited about is that we're going to create a student digital leadership team as well. So we're going to start to kind of develop some of our own um, students to be kind of the, the techs mm-hmm. in the building and kind of be troubleshooters for, for, their, um, for their classrooms or grade levels. Again, because the district... Um, has provided so many resources, kind of you know, allowing the students or enabling the students to really take ownership of not only their device, mm-hmm. but you know, again, the things that they can create on their own. But also, you know, a- always going back to you know, how can they collaborate? How can they sh- show their creativity? And how can um, you provide the choice for them to decide what they want to mm-hmm. use? What, you know, does a PowerPoint make sense for them to show what they've learned? Or can they, you know, create a video of their own? Or can they go on to Scratch mm-hmm. and do a digital story um, that way? But that's also the challenge for me, too, is to kind of try and stay ahead of all this stuff mm-hmm. as best I can. Because in a, in a building this size and with the teachers all at different levels... But moving forward, it's it's challenging to you know want to try mm-hmm. and and solve all the problems at once. When <laughs> sometimes I feel like I don't even know what I'm doing all the time. <laughs> well, I think we all feel that way when it comes to different computer software and programs and ways to integrate. Yeah, but it's never boring. That's for <laughs> sure. Um, I recently just came back from uh, the MassQ summer camp. That was in uh, Natick. MassQ is an organization. It's a computer using educators Mm -hmm. um, where people came from all across the state and some out of state too. Was able to we were able to you know uh, go to different sessions again, just like the way we um, structured our school based PD uh, for technology. Uh, But I was able to go to different sessions about, um, like, how do you create a maker space Mm -hmm. in in your school, whether it's in your classroom or in the computer lab. That's another thing I'm really excited about, too, starting to move into that idea of a space where the students kind of build things. Mm -hmm. And um, whether it's with products like Makey Makey that have a circuit board and, you know, Mm -hmm. sticking banana clips to a piece of fruit. And then making that, you know, kind of an interactive uh, tool or everything from like Legos. Uh, You know, how how can we use Legos Mm -hmm. in a, you know, purposeful way that kind of ties into the learning standards, but also has a student engagement piece. There's so many different ways to do that now, whether it's, you know, coding or, you know, any kind of programming or just building something out of, you know, straws and, you know, popsicle yeah. sticks and things like that. Technology yeah. doesn't have to always just happen on a laptop with, mm-hmm. you know, them staring at the screen for 40 minutes at a time. And that's kind of where I'm trying to move to, to realizing that, you know, my, my instruction doesn't need to all come from the laptop or, you know, necessarily just have, have it all on Brightspace on their class mm-hmm. page or in Office 365, but kind of, you know, bring all those mm-hmm. tools together and also provide the students with the with a choice about how they want to use them. Yeah, I remember one of my favorite projects when I was in school was the egg drop. Like, and that's total engineering technology mm-hmm. where we had like the straws, the popsicle sticks, plastic bag, whatever the teacher decided to bring in and say, we're going to drop this off the top of the school building. We don't want the egg to break. You have two hours. Go build. Right, and the and the whole the whole idea of that is to teach them how to deal with you know the failure mm-hmm. of it not working and realizing that you need to fail to figure out how the next derivation of your you know your egg mm-hmm. drop or your you know your tower is you know how high you can get it. Right. Um, you're never going to figure that out unless you make lots of mistakes right. along the way. And then doing that with other students, you know, to develop those collaboration skills, you know, somebody who, a student who may not feel like they know 
the ins and outs of Office 365 may feel much more empowered by being able to use their hands to build something and to really, Mm -hmm. you know, figure out, okay, this didn't work. Why didn't it work? You know, how can we strengthen the base? How can we, you know, uh, just change it up as you try again and again and again. Right. And all those things build towards even like using the computer because I've, I remember teaching and trying to get students to like use, you in using Scratch, they get frustrated because it's not doing exactly what they want it to do. And the students who were successful, when they took their failure, they'd go back, they'd look through everything. Like they would use the things that we had done that were not technology based to kind of build those skills up. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, just realizing, getting them uh, to realize that, you know, those games that like, they like to play or those applications that they use all the time, you know, somebody didn't, didn't just sit down for an hour and, you know, come up with that. Um, right. You know, it took, you know, months, years to really get, and even those games that they like to play are still being, you know, the next mm-hmm. version can do even more than the last version. And to show them, you know, kind of what's behind the curtain with a lot of those things mm-hmm. can be, you know, can really get them to, to strive to just reflect and go back and try it again or build on what they've you know done done before and scratch is really good for that you know um and some of the other tools like with uh, the code.org that we've done and the hour Mm -hmm. of code that we've been doing here and other teachers have been doing across the district uh, provides great opportunities for students to learn skills like that so before we go because we've been talking for a while now um so the last question I always like to ask is if you had the opportunity to sit in a new hire like and lead a new hire meeting with teachers from all around, what is something that you would tell them about technology and in the district? And like if you had that opportunity to stand up in front of everybody and say, what would that be? I would say that the Springfield Public School District is really on the cutting edge of, of providing Um, the technology and the resources to support that technology make the sky the limit for the students and um, as a teacher to uh, to be able to really go outside of your classroom walls and and um, use the world as um, your classroom uh, with um, tools um, like Skype and and Office 365, and you can collaborate with anybody in the world. And Springfield Public Schools has really done a great job of providing um, the students the resources to be able to do that. So I think the things that are happening in this district are amazing, and they're happening so quick. You know, you can, uh, whatever you whatever you dream up as a teacher can happen here in Springfield because of all the resources that you have at your fingertips. Well, thank you for your time today. I know we're in the middle of summer school right now. So for those listeners wondering, how did he get this recorded so fast? We're doing it during summer school. So thank you. My pleasure. So Suzanne, what do you think about the rest of this interview with Dan? Love it, love it, love it. What I loved about the entire interview, Mike, is how easy it is to hear his passion for teaching. Just everything about it. Every question you asked, his his responses around all topics. Obviously, that's why he's been in the district for 19 years, right? Yeah. You have to love what you do. I, I just can't say enough. I, I could uh, go into detail about uh, the PD that they had at Boland and how awesome that was. I love the fact that they have a digital leadership team. Yeah, that was probably the one of the bigger things that jumped out at me is like, what a great idea. Having a team of teachers throughout the building that are fully invested in helping other teachers using technology in the classroom. 
and either modeling or giving pointers or just kind of gen- setting a general vision for the school in regards to technology. Right. And to, to expand the network of people that other teachers feel comfortable going to so that they don't have in their mind, oh, there's only one person in this building that knows technology. Just expanding that network and the fact that they're collaborating. So it's not just learning a tool and teaching teachers how to use it. They're talking about the best way to use that tool. Right, which goes right back into our SAMR conversation that we've been having. And so that was one of the really great things out of it. Also, I really liked, like, throughout my questioning with Dan, that he was always looking for, like, what else can we do? What else can I try? Like, he's wanting to try podcasting with the students. I loved that, especially because he... he was going to focus on the ELL students. Mm -hmm. So number one, he's not afraid of trying it. But number two, he immediately thought of a different use for it, not just your typical presentation using a green screen. No, let's, how, how can we, how can we improve the performance of our ELL kids? How can we make them feel more comfortable and present better mm-hmm. in front of their peers in a fun way that's not threatening? That's the best part about using technology. Yeah. And also I think like with the idea of the podcasting, like the students will hear themselves talking, which Depending on the homes that they go to, they could have parents. I remember when I was teaching, I had parents who didn't speak English at home, but outside of the home, like when they were with us um, for parent night conferences, they would do their best to speak English and you could tell that they were still learning it themselves. So what better way can a student learning English at school turn around, take home this recording that they could put up on Brightspace or in their OneDrive? Take it home, have their parents listen to it, and hear them learning the language using their own voice instead of just a dinner conversation. I just, there's a million directions they can go with this, and I really like that that was one of the ways he pulled out. I also think what could be a really cool project with podcasting is not necessarily podcasting, but using some of these tools and creating books on I want to say tape, but we don't use tapes anymore. (laughs) You know, like books on CD. Now you're showing your age. Books on MP3s. (laughs) Just like that idea, because I know, like, my kids love, like, we're listening to when we go on longer car drives, like, we're listening to How to Train Your Dragon. And so, like, just the audiobooks are really popular. Audible is a company who keeps growing and growing and growing. Why not, for a project for the students, have them read that read a book record it themselves so that a younger student could use it i love it did you talk to dan about that i honestly didn't think about this till after listening to the interview a couple of times i'm like (laughs) oh this would be such a great project so dan if you're listening i hope that that's something that you can do for others who are listening and you want to learn how to do that you could email me you could email dan you could post on yammer hey has anyone tried this before And it might be a great way to really integrate technology in a useful, authentic learning experience. So yeah, there was a lot with Dan's interview that was really great. I'm glad that we cut it up into two because when that first initial listen to be like, wow, we talked for a while. And so (laughs) there's a lot to talk about. I'd love to hear what um, our educators have to say about Dan's interview and all the ideas that come to their minds after hearing that. Yeah. So post that on Yammer. You can post it in our group. You can email us at DLA support at springfieldpublicschools.com. You can also reach out to us on Twitter. Although the best way to reach out to us is through Yammer because we have that group there. And as those of you who have started to use Yammer, have realized it's a great tool to like talk across the district. I know Dan is on there too, so you could even directly message him that way. I'm going to reiterate that, Mike, because that's very true. We always suggest our DLA support, but the great thing about Yammer is that it's not just Mike and myself and Brendan and Denise who are seeing the questions. Everyone that's in that group gets to see the questions and the answer. Definitely check it out. So that's it for our interviews this week. As we begin to wrap up our podcast here, our question of the month is all about how do you keep your students engaged in the classroom? What are some of the tips and tricks that you use to help those distracted students stay focused and learn? And as always, wherever you listen to this podcast, please review us there. It helps us out. It helps us know how we're doing. And quite frankly, it's fun to get five stars. I mean, of course, that's if you want to give us five stars, but I hope you do. And so we like that feedback, positive, negative, all of it. We want to hear it. We want to know what you like and what you don't like and what you wish there was more of. 
So please leave us that, that feedback. You can leave it on Yammer. You can leave it on Spreaker.com. That's where the podcast is hosted. You could also, if you use iTunes, you can review us in the iTunes store. On Stitcher, we are also available. And same with Google Play Podcasts and YouTube. So we're really everywhere as much as we can be because we enjoy hearing from you and we want to make it as easy as possible for you to hear the podcast. So that's it for this week. I'm Mike Thomas. I'm Suzanne Zargis. And we'll see you next week.